Here in April of 2015, we have just passed a significant 100-year anniversary. That's the centenary of the use of poison gas in warfare. Yay! Yes, it's an interesting story. Let's take a look at it. Let's start at the Bastion of Truthiness Wikipedia, where we can learn, and perhaps more importantly, independently verify from other sources, that the first large-scale use of lethal gas on the battlefield was, in fact, in January of 1915, when 18,000 artillery shells of xylyl bromide tear gas was fired on Russian positions. But the that particular attack did not succeed because it was too cold, so the chemicals actually froze and didn't activate the way they were supposed to. But the Germans went back to the drawing board, and by April, they were ready for a real at- attack, which occurred on the 22nd of April 1915 at Ypres, a.k.a. Wipers, where 168 tons of chlorine was deployed in 5,000 730 cylinders. It did have its intended effect insofar as it, the French colonial troops uh, from Martinique, who were manning the uh, the trenches uh, in the path of the gas, did break ranks, and it did create a 7-kilometer gap in the Allied line. But the Germans weren't particularly prepared to take advantage of that. The infantry was, uh, understandably, they themselves were afraid of the gas, and so didn't fall into positions and didn't take advantage of that gap before the uh, 1st Canadian Division and some French troops regrouped enough to basically uh, plug up the line. So that was the uh, the inglorious start of poison gas itself. So um, that is an interesting story, but why is it important? Well, some of that perspective is put out uh, in from this website, the CBG Network, Uh, that just posted this the other day talking about that history and noting the company behind it. This uh, article notes that as early as in the fall of 1914, in response to a suggestion from the Ministry of War, a commission had been established to deal with the use of poisonous waste from the chemical industry. This commission was chaired by Fritz Haber, director of the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute, a very interesting name that should ring a bell for some of my long-term listeners, Carl Duisberg of Bayer, and the chemist Walter Nernst. The commission recommended the use of chlorine gas, which was a deliberate violation of the Hague Convention respecting the laws and customs of war on land, under which chemical warfare had been banned since 1907. Carl Duisberg was personally present during early tests of poison gas and enthusiastically praised the new weapon. The enemy won't even know when an area has been sprayed with it and will remain quietly in place until the consequences occur. Under Carl Duisberg's leadership, Bayer continued to develop increasingly lethal chemical weapons, first phosgene and later mustard gas. Duisberg vehemently demanded that they be used. This phosgene is the meanest weapon I know. I strongly recommend that we not let the opportunity of this war pass without also testing gas grenades. At Bayer's headquarters in Leverkusen, a school for chemical warfare was built. Duisberg even commissioned the painter Otto Ballhagen to depict scenes of war production for the Bears, Bear Director's Breakfast Room. The painting shows the testing of poison gas and gas masks near Cologne. And yes, this is the painting that uh, he had commissioned. A uh, beautiful painting of the wonderful poison gas. Can't you just smell the, the stench of death hanging in the air? What a beautiful legacy. What a wonderful thing that any normal and non-sociopathic human being would love to see every morning as they're breakfasting, right? And appropriately enough, we have some of the uh, the Prussian ring wraiths uh, up here um, looking on at the scene approvingly, apparently. So this is some of the interesting history of Bear, the Bear Corporation, perhaps best known for aspirin. We invented aspirin. We're, we're loving and wonderful as mother's milk. Well, not quite, and the uh, the disgusting history of Bear does not stop there. In fact, it only gets even worse. If you continue reading in about Bear and uh, the, the activities they were involved in, you'll find that, in fact, Bear was instrumental in founding IG Farben, and just a little bit of background on that. Uh, with the world market for synthetic dyes and other chemical products dominated by the German industry, German firms competed vigorously for market shares. Although cartels were attempted, they lasted at most for a few years. Others argued for the formation of a profit pool or Interessengemeinschaft, uh, literally community of interest. In contrast, the chairman of Bayer, Karl Duisberg, argued for a merger. During a trip to the United States in the spring of 1903, he had visited several of the large American trusts, such as 
Standard Oil, a.k.a. the Rockefellers, U.S. Steel, a.k.a. Uh, Morgan, International Paper, and Alcoa. In 1904, after having returned to Germany, he proposed a nationwide merger of the producers of dye and pharmaceuticals in a memorandum to Gustav von Brüning. So that is the origins of IG Farben, an interesting conglomerate that dominated German industry in the run-up to World War II and throughout World War II. And it was very much the doing of Karl Duisberg, the chairman of Bayer, the very same one who commissioned this lovely painting because he was also very much instrumental in the creation of uh, the poison gas capabilities of the German war machine in the First World War. Moving along with IG Farben and what it actually ended up doing, I will point you to this must read a uh, part of Wall Street and the Rise of Hitler, The Empire of I.G. Farben by Anthony C. Sutton, who will be familiar to my regular listeners. But he goes on to talk about uh, Far Farben and what they were involved in and how they really did make the entire Nazi war machine possible. Just as one example of that, um, the <clears throat> He notes that the process for iso-octane, essential for aviation f fuels, was obtained from the United States. In fact, entirely from the Americans, and has become known to us in detail in its separate stages through our agreements with them, aka Standard Oil of no New Jersey, aka the Rockefeller oligarchs, and is being used very extensively by us. The process for manufacturing tetraethyl lead essential for aviation gasoline was obtained by a IG Farben from the United States, and in 1939, IG was sold $20 million of high-grade aviation gasoline by Standard Oil of New Jersey. Even before Germany manufactured tetraethyl lead uh, by the American process, it was able to borrow 500 tons from the Ethyl Corporation. This loan of vital ethyl, tetra, tetraethyl lead was not repaid, and IG forfeited the million-dollar security. So, in other words, for the, those who can read between the lines, they were given 500 tons of this vital uh, ingredient for the, the, the aviation fuel that uh, was making the Nazi... Uh, uh, Air Force flying at the uh, able to fly at the time, and this goes on to note that uh, further IG purchased large stocks of magnesium from Dow Chemicals for incendiary bombs and stockpiled explosives, stabilizers, phosphorus, and cyanide from the outside world, and then Sutton goes on to list the uh, the ingredients that uh, without which without any one of which the uh, the the Nazi war machine would have been severely hampered if not cri crippled, but uh, all of these were within the the realm of uh, IG Farben to a greater or lesser extent: synthetic rubber, poison gas, plant plastics, magnesium, explosives, gunpowder, uh, aviation gasoline, and synthetic gasoline, all of which were largely supplied by the IG Farben group. Now, who was IG Farben and who were its directors? A fascinating little graphic here that shows it in pretty much uh, plain black and white. You have IG Farben and American IG, and you have uh, some interesting characters associated with these groups. For example, Three, uh, t sorry, two directors of the New York Fed, plus one of the founding members of the New York Fed, Paul Warburg. Again, that name should be very familiar to my regular listeners. And also someone who was on a director of Standard Oil of New Jersey, a.k.a. one of the Rockefeller Seven Sisters, Walter Teagle. So uh, you have the Teagle mitchell warburg connection. And who else? You have people like uh, uh, Fritz Tamir, who was, of course, guilty of Nuremberg war crimes and then was later after serving his sentence for those war crimes, effortlessly stepped back into a position as director of Bayer. Uh, of course, IG Farben split up after the war, but Bayer surfaced once again. But you might think, oh, well, well, James, you might retort, this is this is 100 years ago. Uh, this is 50 years ago. This is, this is so last century. This is in 21st century. Au contraire, mon frère, I would uh, rejoin francophonically. And uh, let's remind ourselves of some of the wonderful things that Bayer Pharmaceuticals and its various branches have been involved in in the 20th, 21st century, including, of course, this old classic. Okay, let's talk about the rat of the week. Why is Bayer Corporation the rat of the week? Internal documents show that after this company positively, absolutely knew that they had a medication that was infected with the AIDS virus, they took the product off the market in the U.S. and then they dumped it in France, Europe, Asia, and Latin America. The medicine's called Factor 8. It was an, inject an injection medicine that was used for hemophiliacs, mostly children. Children had been born with an incurable disease. Hold on, hold on, Mike. So, hold on, hold on. So you're yeah. telling me that Bear knew that this drug was infected with the AIDS virus, uh, they yanked it from the market in America, and then they dumped it in markets overseas? They had to figure out a way, Joe, to make a profit on a product that they could not sell in America. So they made a huge profit. They jumped. 
etc., etc. I, uh, I trust that most of you will have heard that story at some point. If you haven't, please continue looking into that video. But yes, this is a corporation that, let's not forget, in recent history has uh, gladly dumped uh, uh, products that they knew, knew 100% were contaminated on foreign markets because, yeah, you know, it's just the foreign markets. Who cares? Should I go on? Yes, unfortunately, I think I have to. Well, of course, we have to know about some of the other things that Bayer is involved in these days, including Bayer Crop Science, which doesn't give you much insight into what Bayer Crop Science actually is or does, and you won't find a lot of it in, on the on the webpage. It's all talking about growing crops and uh, how can we grow more food for the world, etc. It sounds wonderful. Find out more about the development process of a crop, rotation, uh, prop, crop protection product by visiting the bigger picture. This is the type of propaganda on the Bear Crop Science homepage. One thing you won't find anywhere on the page is the words genetically modified or GMO. But of course, this is one of those biotech companies that is very much involved in GMO patenting and GMO production. Uh, so Bear Crop Science, very much part of that, and probably infamously so for people who remember this story, Bear will pay $750 million to settle gene-modified rice suits. A Bear AG unit agreed to a $750 million settlement resolving claims uh, with about 11,000 U.S. farmers who said a strain of the company's genetically modified rice tainted crops and ruined their export value. The settlement announced yesterday in scores of lawsuits filed against Bayer Crop Science Unit of Lever uh, Leverkusen, blah, blah, blah. And this goes on to tell the story of how this, uh, this genetically modified tainted rice not only tainted the American supply, but tainted exports that were being exported around the world and caused uh, Europe to actually stop importing U.S. rice. So uh, as well as uh, Japan and Russia, they all stopped buying U.S. grown long grain rice because of this contamination. So... Uh, ultimately, Bayer had to pay $750 million to the affected farmers. But that's only one example of one particular scandal. And of course, there's many others to go through. There's a good post here on uh, ACED Europe about GMO patents held by Bayer and BASF talking about the, I believe, 260 patents at the time of the writing of this article in 2013, GMO patents that uh, Bayer held of one form or another, or Bayer and its, its partner, BASF. But uh, if you think there's some kind of silver lining to this gray cloud, you might be right. But unfortunately, there's an even bigger gray cloud behind it. Uh, talking about patents for conventional plants, this uh, article notes, over the past 25 years, Bayer and others have not managed to shake the European consumer's skepticism toward genetic engineering. So BASF have given up and moved its entire GMO research unit to the U.S., in addition, the prophecies uh, made about genetic modification have turned out to be incorrect. Yields did not rise significantly, and the use of pesticides was not reduced. For all of those reasons, Bayer is now intensifying its use of conventional methods of growing plants again. Yay, right? That's a good thing. Well, however, conventional growing is only profitable if the company has patent rights for it, so Bayer aims to obtain these and has previously been successful. So again, talking about the patenting of life, one of those bizarre outgrowths of a bizarre Supreme Court ruling of a few decades ago that now is having very, very real uh, real world implications as literal life forms are being patented. And, and that leads to the types of suits that we both associate with Monsanto suing farmers for having their genetically modified garbage on their fields without their without a contract. So this kind of craziness is going on, and most of it is associated in the public's mind with a company like Monsanto, which is easy to identify and hate on, and for good reasons. But let's not forget companies like Bayer, which are absolutely very much steeped in this tradition, as every bit as much, if not more so, than companies like Monsanto. So let's keep that in mind as we celebrate 